True Gay Crime contains coarse language, adult themes, and content that is violent and disturbing. If at any time you feel you need help, please refer to the toll-free crisis lines in the show notes. Welcome to another episode of True Gay Crime. I'm your host, Patrick Morano, and on today's episode, we are covering the attempted murder by the British political figure, Jeremy Thorpe. Let's get into the story of Jeremy Thorpe. All right, it starts. In 1957, the British government set up a committee to examine the standing laws surrounding homosexuality and published the Wolfenden Report, which recommended decriminalization, which is a good thing. But the government in power at the time did nothing because they were afraid of public backlash. Fast forward to... First of all, they're always afraid of public backlash. This is like the thing that always stops progress. But guess what, government? You be the leaders. You be the leaders, and then the the backwards assholes, you just drag them into the 20th slash 21st century. I mean, just make your fucking choices for the good of everybody, and then drag the assholes along that don't want to come. I know they're voters too, and you want to stay in power, and you want to keep your job. It's, it's, it's tangled, tangled. Okay, fast forward to 1965, when sexual offenses bill was sponsored and took its cues from the Wolfenden Report. A 65 opinion poll, 1965 opinion poll, showed that 63% of people in England, the UK, didn't think it was a crime to be gay, although 93% agreed that gay men needed medical or psychiatric treatment. Okay, so it's not a crime, but it's a disease, I guess. By 1965, a majority of MPs in the House of Commons were also into decriminalization, which came about in 1967. The sponsored proposal legalized acts that met the conditions of being between two consenting consenting adults in private. It did not apply to the Merchant Navy or the Armed Forces, which is kind of strange. It's kind of like, okay, guys, being gay is not a criminal act anymore unless you're in the Navy or Armed Forces. They're probably like, okay, most of the people in the Navy and the Armed Forces are men. And if we decriminalize gay sex, they're going to spend more time in the showers than they are training for for battle or something i don't know the bill set the age of consent for homosexual activity to 21 which was five years higher than for heterosexual activity so at the time most of the people in government didn't agree or condone homosexuality but they felt it wasn't any of their business and that gays shouldn't be penalized for it um so the comments of roy jenkins who was the home secretary of the time captured the government's attitude he said quote Those who suffer from this disability carry a great weight of shame all their lives. So the bill was supported by the senior leaders of the Church of England, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the bill got royal assent on July 27th, 1967. So there was this guy named Lord Aaron, and he was afraid that if they passed a law decriminalizing gay sex, that there would be this huge public debate. So he said, just to make things crystal clear, he said, quote, I ask those homosexuals to show their thanks by comporting themselves quietly and with dignity. Any form of ostentatious behavior now or in the future or any form of public flaunting would be utterly distasteful and make the sponsors of the bill regret that they had done what they had done. What a fucking dick. (laughs) Thank you, sir. Thank you for the crumbs of equal rights. Thank you. We really appreciate all of these little scraplings that you're dropping from the table. We'll be quiet and we'll just scurry off into the corner. What a dick. Anyway, according to gay activist Peter Thatchell, dissent against the bill could be summed up by the Earl of Dudley's 1966 statement. Okay, this guy was a total dick too. Listen to this. The Earl of Dudley said this, quote, Homosexuals are the most disgusting people in the world. Prison is much too good a place for them. In fact, that is the place where many of them like to go for obvious reasons um earl of dudley you've obviously given this a lot of thought why are you even thinking about gays having butt sex in prison or prison or butt sex like what is your deal (laughs) you're obviously gay or you have issues with it oh oh get this so i googled him because i'm like who is this asshole so not only is he an asshole who said that fucking shit but but he is said to have cheated on his wife He fathered a bastard child, 
and he was a regular at a strip club called Murray's Cabaret, where he once proposed to a 17-year-old stripper. So, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, sir. Okay, so for centuries, gay sex in the UK was illegal, and by the 50s, gay men are being charged left, right, and center, including a bunch of well-known political figures. So there was a Labour MP for Paddington North. He was forced to resign his seat in 53 after a conviction of soliciting in a public lavatory. The following year, Lord Montague of Beaulieu was imprisoned for a year after being convicted of gross indecency. And then four years later, uh, Ian Harvey, a junior foreign office minister in the government, was found guilty of indecent behavior with a Coldstream guardsman. That sounds hot. In November 1958, he lost both his ministerial job and his parliamentary seat at Harrow East. He was ostracized by the conservative, of course, the conservative party and by most of his former friends and never again held a position in public life. So all of that to say anyone in politics at the time that we're about to talk about knew that if it ever came out that they were gay, it would bring their career to a screeching halt. London, December 1968. The city twinkled in the dusk with the festive lights of Christmas. Shoppers queued up in shops with full arms of parcels. The weather was cold and damp, but the excitement of the holiday season put a twinkle in the air. The Palace of Westminster reflected in the cold water of the Thames as Big Ben chimed on the hour. Inside the House of Commons, Member of Parliament Peter Bessel made his way to the office of his friend and colleague Jeremy Thorpe. He cracked open the door and poked his head inside. You wanted to see me? Yes, I did. Please come in. Have a seat. Thorpe began. We have a problem that is not going away. You know it, I know it, and we have to stop him. If he continues like this, my life, my job, the Liberal Party, it's all at risk. Bessel sat still, knowing that what Thorpe was saying was true, but not knowing what to do to change things. So, Thorpe continued. I've spoken to David Holmes, and he's willing to help. Help how? asked Bessel, afraid to know the answer. I mean, what could David Holmes, an assistant treasurer of the Liberal Party, do to fix the threat? Holmes was a friend for sure, best man at Thorpe's wedding and completely loyal, but still. I've spoken to Holmes, and he's agreed to kill our problem. We've talked about it, and we've got to get rid of him. It's no worse than shooting a sick dog. We'll dump the body down one of Cornwall's disused tin mines. So who were these men plotting to kill that December 1968, and why? To find out, we go back. John Jeremy Thorpe was born in 1929 to a very political conservative family. He was the son and grandson of conservative MPs. He attends Eton College, which if you don't know is a very posh independent boarding school for boys um, in England, that costs up to £42,000 per year and its pupils have gone on to become prime ministers, world leaders, Nobel laureates, blah, blah, blah. Money, money, money. Aristocracy, too. So that shows, basically, that uh, you need to run into these run in these circles. And these are circles with money and connections. It's not that these people are smarter. It's not that they work harder. They just have early breaks and they're running in the right circles. So anyways, then he studies uh, law at Trinity College, Oxford, which again, is one of the most prestigious universities on the planet. And there is evidence of teaching there from 1096, making it the oldest university in the English speaking world. It's here Thorpe decides on a political career, but instead of following in his family's conservative footsteps, he joins the small centrist liberal party, offering a small national platform. He quickly becomes secretary, then president of the Oxford Liberal Club, where he meets many of the party's leading people. In 1952, Thorpe is chosen as a pros prospective liberal parliamentary candidate for North Devon, a constituency in southwest of England, and a conservative-held seat where, at the 1951 general election, the liberals had finished in third place behind the Labour and Conservative parties. Thorpe works hard to overcome that third-place position with a slogan, quote, A vote for the liberals is a vote for freedom. And at the 1955 general election, he cut the Conservatives' lead in half. Four years later, in October 1959, he succeeds in bringing the Liberal Party to power over the Conservatives and the Labour Party and captures the seat in North Devon with a majority. Career-wise, he is on the map. Writer and former MP Matthew Paris describes Thorpe as one of the more dashing among the new MPs elected in 1959. But his dashing ways, which make him stand out, also make him a target. So, 
Thorpe was briefly considered as best man at the 1960 wedding of his Eton College buddy, Anthony Armstrong Jones, to Princess Margaret. Yes, the Princess Margaret, Queen Elizabeth II's sister. Anyway, he gets rejected when vetting checks indicate that he might have homosexual tendencies. The security agency M15 keeps records on all members of parliament, and they had added this information to Thorpe's file. I love that they refuse him because of he might be gay or there's possible gay tendencies or something like like the monarchy is so pristine like hello prince charles cheating on diana for years and not keeping it a secret hello prince andrew friends with convicted convicted sex offender sex trafficker pedophile jeffrey epstein like okay let's introduce the other protagonist of the story his name is norman yosef he was born in kent southeast england in 1940 he later changes his name to Scott, um, Norman Scott, his last name. He changes in 1967. So for the purpose of this uh, podcast, I'm just going to call him by his last name of Scott moving forward, even though he only changes it later on in the story because it'll be too confusing otherwise. So we're calling him Scott, okay? His mother was Ina, and her second husband, Albert, he abandons the family soon after Scott is born. His childhood is unremarkable, and he leaves school at 15 years old with zero qualifications. So this guy is the... Polar opposite of Thorpe. Thorpe was born into money and privilege. He goes to the best schools. He gets the best education. Scott, on the other hand, is born dirt poor, broken family, uh, leaves school at 15, has zero qualifications. Okay. So along the way, he goes to an animal charity and he gets a pony. And he actually learns to ride the pony and he becomes a really good rider. Because he's poor, at 16, he's prosecuted for theft of a saddle and some pony food, and he's put on probation. So he's so poor that he has to steal food for his pony, and obviously he's prosecuted for it. So already, you know, you're born poor, you have no advantages, you have to get by however way you can, and I'm not saying theft is correct, but obviously he didn't have a choice, and then you're being prosecuted. Now you have a record, like, it's just one thing, it's just a snowball effect, isn't it? Anyway, his probation officer encourages him to take riding lessons at school at Oxford, and then he finds work at a stable in Cheshire. So Cheshire is a really fancy county in the northwest of England near Manchester, and this is where he finds himself in fancy circles. So although he comes from, you know, poor, humble beginnings, now he's sort of, through horses, is rubbing shoulders with people that have money and power. He's a bit of a social climber. And uh, Scott starts to soak up the high life and does everything to distance himself and forget his poor and humble beginnings. He starts rumors about being aristocratic, but through family tragedies, he was orphaned, and now he has to fend for himself. A lot of these st stories we hear, I mean, um, these podcasts, we're hearing about people trying desperately to fit in with certain groups who ultimately reject them, and then it leads to terrible things, especially when it's such a class system, like England is a perfect example of like, even today, you're you're born somewhere. Of course, it, it's changed. It's not like the old days where you're like, you were born a serf, you'll die a serf, you know, but still, you're born into opportunity or you're not, right? In 1959, Scott moves to Oxfordshire and works in the Kingham stables where he learns dressage, which is what, um, if you watch The Crown, that's what Princess Anne is doing when she's riding the horse. You know, they wear the little hat, they wear the, the outfit, the riding outfit, and they're jumping over the the thing, and it's all about, like, show and jumping and all that. That's dressage. Um, okay, remember, okay, so now he's in Oxfordshire, Scott is, and remember, Thorpe went to Oxford University, which is in Oxfordshire, so the stables where Scott is working are owned by Norman Vater, who he himself was also poor, um, but is a self-made man and he inflated his status to impress others on the way up. So for him, it worked. So I guess Scott was giving it a shot as well. Why not? Vader in his new position and status had friends in high places. And one of them was Thorpe, Jeremy Thorpe Bond, James Bond. Um, unfortunately for Scott, he wasn't getting along with Vader or his colleagues at the stable. This is going to be a recurring theme, by the way. We're going to see Scott go through a lot of jobs, so just buckle up. Apparently, Scott is the type of guy who you like instantly, plays a bit of the victim to get your sympathy. Then once you're hooked on his drama, he unleashes hysterical temper tantrums. So Scott is a nightmare, just to give you a heads up. 
So now this is how Jeremy Thorpe meets Scott. In late 1960, Thorpe visits the Kingham stables where Scott works. They meet, and Thorpe is so taken with the guy that he tells him if he ever needs him or ever needs help to call him up at the House of Commons. Big mistake. Scott is pretty unstable, and soon after that he fights with Vader, who's his boss, and he leaves the stables and spends most of the next year in and out of psychiatric care. Then, in 1961, after discharging himself from care, he heads on down to the House of Commons to look for Thorpe. Careful what you say and who you say it to, because they may take you up on their offer, on that offer. By this time, he's penniless, homeless, and had left his national insurance card, which is basically, in Canada, your social insurance number or your social security card in the U.S., he had left it at his place of employment, so he didn't have that anymore, so he couldn't access unemployment benefits. He explains all of this to Thorpe, who now promises to help, because he said, if you need help, come and see me at the House of Commons. According to Scott, that's the same night that they start their affair, which to me seems reasonable. Um, now, they have differing stories. Scott is saying, this is where the affair starts. Thorpe says, we never had an affair, we're just friends. Seems reasonable to me and quite common, that there's this older, wealthy, powerful man who comes across this younger guy that he is going to take under his wing and help with really the expectation of sex. I mean, that's not unheard of. So also, Thorpe had many relationships and liaisons with men, so it's not like he wasn't already doing that. Uh, but this was hugely risky and a very secret life. All homosexual activity, like we mentioned, was illegal in the United Kingdom until 1967, and the truth about his sexuality would have instantly ended his political career, as we mentioned before. So, Scott has his beloved Jack Russell named Miss Tish, and that he has with him all the time. He's an animal lover. That's just a bit of a sidebar. But they're taken to the home of Thorpe's wealthy mother, Ursula. And during the night, Thorpe slips into Scott's room, and according to Scott's testimony later on in the trial, had sex with him for the first time. Thorpe nicknamed his new lover Bunnies. I wonder what that's about. Why Bunnies? Maybe because they fucked like bunnies? That's my, that's my guess. For his part, Thorpe says there was definitely a friendship, but it wasn't sexual. Again, I kind of call bullshit there, um, because why would somebody like Thorpe, who is rich and powerful and in politics, extremely busy man, obviously, Social climber, uh, power hungry, you know, advancing his career. Why would he have time for somebody who has nothing? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying Scott wasn't a charming man with lots of qualities, but there, there, there would be no reason for Thorpe to call this person his friend for years and and years and fifteen years have a friendship with this man if it wasn't sexual. Give me. Give me a fucking break. They're, they they wouldn't have anything in common. They don't run in the same circuit. Uh, uh, anyway. Thorpe gets Scott... Okay, so now Thorpe is helping him out. Thorpe gets Scott a place to stay in London and then sticks him with a family friend in Barnstable in North Devon. He pays for ads for Scott to work with horses because um, he was advertising, hey, I know how to work with horses. I'm looking for work. So Thorpe was paying for the ads in the papers for Scott. He also sets him up with odd jobs and even promises to help him get to France to study dressage, which all of this is classic sugar daddy stuff. This is, you know, we have sex and I'm older and I have money and power and I'm going to use that to help you along. I'm going to send you to France so you can learn dressage. I'm going to help you get jobs. I'm going to do the things that I can do to help you. Anyway. Scott, so you know, was a thief and a liar. And he tries to get money he said was owing to him because his father had died in a plane crash, which authorities looked into and found that his father was actually alive and well. So, Then police questioned him about a stolen suede jacket, and Thorpe comes to his defense saying that Scott suffers from mental health issues and he's in his care. So Thorpe, at this point, is still covering for him. In April 1962, Scott finally gets a replacement national insurance card, which he says Thorpe hung on to acting as his employer. Thorpe denies this is true, and the missing card, it was an ongoing pain in the ass for Scott, who was starting to unravel. So there's a lot of back and forth with this fucking 
national insurance card. He has it. He doesn't have it. He bugs Thorpe to, to, I don't know why, like if you lose your social security card, your social insurance card, don't you apply for another one? Like, don't you just go on the government website and you, and you order like another one? Is, is that how it goes? Okay. I know they didn't have the interweb, but like, don't, you just order another card. I don't know why this is, this is an ongoing issue with this guy through the whole story. So again, bear with me. Scott is a bit of a, a nightmare roller coaster. Um, case in point, he even mentioned to a friend how he was angry with Thorpe and was going to shoot him and then kill himself. So his friend goes to the police to report the statement, and when Scott is taken into custody for questioning, he reveals everything about his sexual relationship with Thorpe, even producing letters as evidence. The police aren't impressed with the letters, but M15 <laughs> make another note in Thorpe's file. Poor Thorpe. Oh my god, like, M15 is like, ooh, okay, another gay note. Let's put a little uh, asterisk there on his file. In 1963, Scott was in Ireland working as a... So now he's left the country again. That's the other thing. This guy pinballs around Europe like a crazy person. Scott is in Ireland now working as a riding instructor until he falls off the horse and gets hurt at the Dublin Horse Show. Then he moves back to England and gets a job at a riding school in Wolverhampton. Uh, in Wolverhampton, where he works for a few months until his erratic behavior gets him fired again. All this time, he and Thorpe stay in touch. And when Scott hears about a horse job in Switzerland, Thorpe pulls some strings and gets him the job. So Thorpe is doing everything in his power to really help this guy. And he's being, in my opinion, he's being super patient with him. I don't know. Scott must give good dick. Because Thorpe is digmatized. Thorpe is digmatized, for sure. Um, Thorpe pulls some strings, gets him the job, but guess what? Scott goes to Switzerland and comes home almost immediately complaining that the conditions were impossible. I'm not sure what that means. Switzerland's a lovely country. But he left Switzerland so fast he forgot his suitcase full of letters and proof of his sexual relationship with Thorpe. Like, this guy's a nightmare. He's just leaving a trail of shit <laughs> across the country. Like, now he doesn't have his suitcase and written letters from Thorpe and love letters. Like, okay. Now, while Scott is going through jobs like Trump went through press secretaries, Thorpe is thriving in his political career. He gets noticed for his attacks on government bureaucracy and in October 64, increases his majority lead in North Devon. The next year, he becomes the Liberal Party treasurer, which for him is a huge step towards becoming leader of the party. So he's doing great. By early 1965, Scott has pinballed back to Ireland, working with horses and riding. Thorpe complaining about his lost luggage from Switzerland and his still missing national insurance card, which I guess he lost again. Thorpe was over it by this point and refused to help or take responsibility for these things. Also, Thorpe at this point is getting so far in his career, he can't have these loose ends like these, this crazy guy um, contacting him all the time. So um, Scott gets really pissed off now that Thorpe is turning his attention somewhere else and he writes Thorpe's mom this long letter that starts, quote, For the last five years, as you probably know, Jeremy and I have had a homosexual relationship. End quote. The letter blamed Thorpe for awakening, quote, this vice that lies latent in every man. So now he's even blaming... This guy's the ultimate victim, also, by the way. Uh, Scott is. He blames Thorpe for everything that goes wrong in his life, even though, by all accounts, Thorpe tried everything to have this to give this guy you know a leg up in life now he's blaming him for being gay <laughs> so thorpe's mom shows him the letter to which he drafts a quasi legal statement rejecting the quote damaging and groundless accusations and accusing scott of attempting to blackmail him but he doesn't send the document instead he turns to his longtime friend peter bessel for advice so now enter peter bessel he's a successful businessman before going to politics in the 1950s he got the attention of the liberal party when in 1955 he increased the liberal votes in a series of liberal wins during the 55 to 59 parliament he was an admirer of and friend of Thorpe, and the men saw success after success together in the Liberal Party. They were climbing the ladder, and they helped each other along the way. Bessel noticed that Thorpe had no female friends and didn't seem to notice women at all. A former MP confided in Bessel that he thought that Thorpe was gay and that others thought the same thing. Bessel takes it on himself to protect his friend from these rumors that would kill his career. So, 
Bessel admires Thorpe, but he's also self-interested. He knows that he has hitched his wagon to Thorpe, and he knows if Thorpe goes down, Bessel is going to be implicated somehow too. So he, his job in life is to protect Thorpe. So Bessel becomes the Giuliani to Thorpe's Trump, and he flies around doing his bidding, basically. So in April 1965, he flies out to Dublin to meet with Scott. He finds him taking advice... So he finds Scott taking advice from a Jesuit priest who, believing Scott's side of things, had been advising him on what to do. Bessel, for his part, warned Scott that blackmailing a public figure was a bad idea, but that he was willing to find his fucking luggage and national insurance card, and he also talked about a possible horse job in America. I mean, they were really trying hard to get rid of him. They, they, were, they were still being kind at this point. They're like, oh, it's okay, crazy pants. We'll we'll find your luggage. I'll get you another national insurance card. Hey, and by the way, do you know there's this horse job in America? You might want to look into that. Bessel's work pays off. Scott calms down. They find his fucking luggage, and the incriminating letters are gone. Of course, because guess what? Bessel opened the suitcase. He took out the incriminating letters, um, documents and love notes and things like that, and he gets rid of them. Um, for the next couple of years, Scott works odd jobs, of course, in Ireland, ending up in a monastery, and this is where he changes his name, his last name, to Scott. So now we're all on board there. In April 1967, Scott wrote to Bessel from Ireland saying he needed a new passport with his new name so he could go to America to start a new life. But of course, a second later, a letter, but of course, a second letter comes from Bessel. But of course, a second letter comes to Bessel from Scott saying he was now in England. He had money issues, again, with medical bills and other debts. By now, Thorpe was the official leader of the Liberal Party. Yay, Thorpe, good job. So Bessel thought of a plan to protect his friend and now leader of the party. He paid Scott five to ten pounds a week, saying it was to cover the insurance uh, that the insurance card normally would. But we know it was just like hush money. Just like, okay, I'm going to pay you a retainer and you just shut the fuck up. He also got him a passport. But by this time, Scott changed his mind about America and wanted instead to have a career as a model. This guy is all over the map. And um, by the way, like there's pictures of him and modeling. Really? Really? Are you sure, girl? I don't know. That. You don't look like a model to me. Okay, he asked Bessel, okay, so Scott asked Bessel for 200 pounds to get his career started. Bessel refuses, but then he finally agrees on 70, 75 pounds, assuming that there would be no more asks. But as if, if somebody is blackmailing you and you're giving them money, they're not going anywhere. Like, feeding into a blackmailer is never going to end well. Let's be honest. Thorpe wasn't an instant success as leader of the Liberal Party, however. His charismatic small-town ways didn't translate immediately to the national stage. But his engagement to Caroline Allpass in April 68 helped reassure people that he was not a flaming queen. On his wedding, he reportedly told his friend Bessel, quote, if it's the price I've got... Oh, let me do an accent, hold on. Quote, if it's the price I've got to pay to lead this old party, I'll pay it. Oh my god, I'm so bad at accents. Let me try one more time. <clears throat> she sells seashells by the seashore. Yeah. Quote, If it's the price I've got to pay to lead this old party, I'll pay it. Um, anyway, basically the engagement and the marriage was to just appease the party, stop the rumors, and earn him five points in the polls. So for a lot of that year, Thorpe doesn't even hear from Scott until, of course, later when Scott runs out of money and job prospects. Scott was really becoming a pain in the ass by this point, since Thorpe was riding high in his political party, and his future seemed bright. So, his protector, Bessel, again, started with the weekly cash retainer. I mean, obviously, you guys are guilty. Like, I mean, obviously, there was a sexual relationship if you're paying this guy off. Otherwise, you wouldn't even bother, because it would just be all false. Anyway, this arrangement doesn't last long until Scott starts acting up again. And at this point, Thorpe calls Bessel into his office to tell him, quote, We've got to get rid of him, meaning Scott. It's no worse than shooting a sick dog. So, I mean, to say that Thorpe was at the end of his rope at this point, I think is an understatement. He's actually saying, we need to get rid of Scott. This is not working. He's the leader of the Liberal Party. Like, he, this is a long way to fall for Thorpe. 
Then, in January 69, Thorpe calls back Bessel and Holmes into his office to talk about ways they could eliminate Scott. Both Bessel and Holmes agree that none of their ideas are doable, but they promise to keep brainstorming on the subject. That's nice of them. They hoped if they stalled long enough, Thorpe would change his mind. They also knew if they said no outright that Thorpe would look somewhere else for help and that it would be much worse. So they bided their time by dragging their heels. All of their plans came to an end in May 1969 when they discovered that Scott had gotten married. Yup. To a woman. I know. What? By early 1971, Thorpe's career hit a rough patch. He had a disastrous election result and saw the Conservatives gain a lot of ground. Also, he faced censure since he was spending party money like it was nobody's business, bringing them into the verge of bankruptcy. But then, his wife Caroline dies in a car crash a few months later. People forget about the scandal and they sympathize with the grieving widow. I mean, he must have been like... I mean, I'm sure he liked her. I wonder what it was like at home for them. I wonder if she knew. Or he just, like, had sex with her once in a while and they just called it a day. Hmm. Meanwhile, in the Scott camp, there was trouble. No, you're kidding. The guy still didn't have his insurance card. And his wife was now pregnant. But without the card, they couldn't claim maternity benefits. Doesn't she have her own card? What is it with these fucking cards? Desperate as always, Scott threatens to tell the newspapers about his affair with Thorpe. But Julian, I mean, uh, Bessel, steps in to save the day by ordering an emergency card for him. A year later, Scott's marriage is over, he blames Thorpe, and he threatens to expose it. So this is basically, the, the theme of the whole story is Scott is broke, he blames Thorpe, and he threatens to go to the papers. I mean, uh, thank you for listening to the podcast. I'll see you next week. <laughs> like that's literally this that that's the plot line of this whole thing. Um, anyway, uh, Bessel steps in because that's what he does, and he makes sure Thorpe's name never comes up in the divorce hearings. Oh, in Scott's divorce hearings, and he arranges for Thorpe to pay all the legal fees anonymously for Scott's divorce. So again, that looks super guilty. The next year. I mean, this is going on and on. This isn't like this happened in one year or six months. This is like 15 years. This time. The next year, Scott moves to North Wales, where he gets friendly with a widow named Gwen. She believes all the stories of mistreatment by Thorpe and goes to her MP named Hooson, who is no friend of Thorpe's. Hooson suggests a meeting at the House of Commons. On the 26th, 27th of May, 1971, Scott spills the tea to Hooson and David Steele, who was the liber Liberals' chief whip. Neither man really believes the bullshit stories, but they decide it's worth looking into further. So, a confidential party inquiry was arranged by Lord Byers, the leader of the Liberals in the House of Lords. Byers acts like a tough guy with Scott, not offering him a seat. I love that that's being tough in England. Like, I'll show him. I won't offer him a seat to sit down. Like in the States, they would, uh, tough would be like throwing him up against the wall and like pummeling his face. Anyway, Apparently, the tough guy act works because Scott gets confused, he changes his story a few times, and he cries a lot. So, Byers concludes that Scott is just a blackmailer who needs psychiatric help, and their conclusion was that there was no evidence of wrongdoing, and they dismiss Scott's allegations. So, Thorpe has a win there. Scott is more pissed than ever, and he goes to the newspapers, but nobody would print the uncorroborated and unreliable story. So in March 1972, his widow friend from North Wales, Gwen, dies, and Scott takes the opportunity at the inquest to blame Thorpe for her death and for ruining his life. Okay, that's his MO. No one pays attention to these accusations, and Scott falls into a depression and takes tranquilizers, and he goes quiet for a bit. Then in 1972-73, the liberals are re revived, and Thorpe remarries. This time he marries... Marion, Countess of Harewood, on March 14th, 1973. Listen to this. Her full name is Maria Donata Nanetta Paulina Gustava Erwina Willemine Stein. I'm, that's not a joke. And her previous husband had been the first cousin of the queen, but he had cheated on uh, Maria Donata Nanetta Paulina Gustava Erwina Willemine Stein. Uh, for many years, he had a daughter with his affair. And then finally, Marion was like, okay, 
uh, I concede defeat and he she divorces him. So then she marries Thorpe, which is a really good connection. Like he's, I mean, a breath away from royalty at this point, right? Uh, meanwhile, on the political side, the party wins by-elections and local government gains. And in February 1974, with more than 6 million votes, the liberals had their best election results since World War II. Meanwhile, Crazy Pants Scott was living in the West Country when in January 1974 he meets Tim Keegwin, Thorpe's conservative opponent in North Devon. Scott again spills the tea on his version of his relationship with Thorpe. However, Keegwin's superiors tell him not to use the material since there was no proof. Scott also blabs to his doctor, who is treating his depression. <laughs> this guy will just talk to anyone. He was just walking down the street, just yelling his story to anyone who's going to listen. Um, he shows the doctor a portfolio of papers, which the doctor, without knowledge or consent from Scott, sells to Holmes. Now, remember, Holmes and Bessel were the guys in Thorpe's office uh, planning the murder of Scott. So, um, how, first of all, how did the doctor get his hands up? Like, first of all, actually, go back. Why is Scott bringing the papers to the doctor? I guess a follow-up appointment. He's like, you know what? I told him about the story. I'm going to bring these papers to really prove my point because it didn't seem like the doctor believed me. But if I show him the love letters and then what? He forgot them in the doctor's office and the doctor was like, I'm going to sell these to Holmes. I'll make a quick buck. Ha 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 twirling his mustache like it's so strange how this all unfolds but um anyway so remember Bessel who was the Giuliani to Thorpe's Trump Bessel had since moved to California by this point and Holmes is now Thorpe's main protector guy so Holmes buys the paper from the doctor uh and the doctor makes 2,500 pounds off the paper off the papers which Holmes burns immediately because that was just evidence that Scott and Thorpe had a relationship, so Holmes burns that shit. Another bunch of incriminating love letters and papers are discovered by workers who are renovating Bessel's old office in London. Okay, how many love letters and papers and thing and <laughs> portfolios and, you know, accordion fo file folders and, I mean, filing cabinets and, and Jesus Christ, like, how many... Like, okay, okay, I get it. There were no cell phones. They weren't texting and stuff like that. I guess they wrote each other letters. But did you write every day? Why is there so much evidence of your of your relationship, of your sexual relationship? Okay. And also, Bessel, you didn't really do a good job, much like Giuliani, because you left this whole portfolio of evidence in an old office in London, and then you move out to California. Like, talk about just washing your hands of the situation and running away. I mean, come on. Anyway, they found a briefcase containing letters and photographs that apparently compromised Thorpe, among them Scott's 1965 letter to Thorpe's mom. The builders didn't know what to do with the material, so they took it to the Sunday Mirror. Okay, the Sunday Mirror is a total scandal rag. Also, it's base, it's the Inquirer. So, I mean, I love that the builders, that was their point of reference. They, they saw these letters, they knew they were incriminating, and they're like, hey, let's take it to the Inquirer. Anyway, the Inquirer, or the Sunday Mirror, doesn't print the story, but instead, they return it all to Thorpe. But of course, they kept copies for themselves in their files. They're not stupid. In early 1974, Holmes later stated that Thorpe was insistent that Scott be killed. Quote, Jeremy felt he would never be safe with that man around. Okay, so here comes a slew of characters that are involved in the planning of this botched murder. Ready? Holmes calls up a business acquaintance, carpet salesman, named John Le Messurier who introduces him to a fruit machine salesman named George Deacon, who speaks to an airline pilot named Andrew Newton, who says he's willing to do the job after 16 pints of beer and agrees to kill Scott for 10,000 pounds. I mean, what's a fruit machine salesman? They had, they had like vending machines that sold fruit. I think they did have that, didn't they? Like, like wrapped slices of apple and stuff. Anyway, um, anyway, so also, they nicknamed this pilot uh, Chicken Brains. And his initial plan, the pilot's initial plan for killing him, as he testified later in court, was to attack his victim with a chisel hidden inside a bouquet of flowers. Wait. So the fruit machine salesman puts the pilot in touch with Holmes. I'm not going to bother with names anymore because it's too confusing. So it's the fruit guy, the carpet guy, and the pilot. Okay. So anyway, while they're organizing the murder, okay, 
Thorpe is getting the money ready to pay the pilot. He calls a wealthy businessman in the Bahamas who always gives generally uh, generously to the Liberal Party. He asked for 50,000 pounds, where 10,000 would be set aside into the hands of Thorpe's friend, Nadir Dinshaw, who lived in the Channel Islands. He explained that it was for unspecific election expenses, and when Dinshaw gets the $10,000, he passes it to Holmes for Thorpe's request and earmarked for the pilot. Okay, so we've got everything. We've got the person who's going to commit the crime. We've got the money ready to pay him. Let's do this thing. So the pilot first meets Holmes in October 75 when he gets a down payment for the operations. Then on the 12th of that month, the pilot, calling himself at this point Peter Keene, drives to Barnstaple in a yellow Mazda where he tracks down Scott. He goes up to Scott and tells him that he's been hired to protect him from a Canadian hitman. Why Canadian, you ask? I do not know. Scott's conspiracy-prone mind believes every word, and he sets up another time to meet with Keene. But I guess he was a little suspicious, because he asked his buddy to write down Keene's license plate number as well. On the 24th of October, the pilot, who is now driving a Ford saloon, arranges to pick up Scott near uh, north of Barnstaple. The pilot says he's going to drive to Poor Lock, which is about 25 miles away, and suggests they drive together so that they can chat along the way. So Scott agrees, and he gets in the car. But he brings with him his new pet. He bought a Great Dane named Rinka. The pilot, unfortunately, is afraid of dogs. He doesn't like this, but the dog was either coming or Scott wasn't going. So the pilot didn't have a choice. At Porlock, the pilot leaves Scott and Rinka at a hotel while he supposedly did his business. Then at 8 p.m., they all pile back into the car to head home. So they're halfway home. On a deserted stretch of road, the pilot pretends to get sleepy, because now it's dark outside, and he swerves on the road. He suggests that Scott take over the driving. Scott gets out, followed by the dog, of course, is all excited because she thinks she's going for a walk. And they go around to the driver's side, only to see the pilot holding a gun. Now the pilot is super nervous about the dog, and he shoots her in the head. Then he turns to Scott and says, it's your turn now. But can you believe this? The gun fails to go off several times. So many times that Scott has the chance to scramble away. The pilot becomes panicked and he drives off, leaving Scott alone with a dead dog on the road. Scott is eventually picked up by a passing car and goes to the police, who then easily find the pilot through the license plate number Scott had from earlier from that month. So that to say that that was a botched murder is an understatement. By now, all the papers know about this homosexual scandal, but no one could print anything because they would be liable, which you know is defamation by written or printed words. But then, in January 1976, uh, Scott appears in court on a minor social security fraud charge, but takes the opportunity while he's in court to blame his sexual relationship with Thorpe on his troubles, which is his MO. But since he does that in court... Uh, the claim is made in court, it's protected from libel, and the papers are able to report on it. Now, everything unravels from here. The Daily Mail tracks down Bessel in California, and in a long-ass interview claims uh, that he was blackmailed by Scott and paid to protect Thorpe. Then in March, newspapers reported that Holmes had bought papers from a doctor, and a few days after that, the money that was wired to the Bahamas from the Channel Islands for the purpose of paying the pilot comes out. So, like, everything is just like dominoes. Like, all of this information is coming out now. At this point, there's a lot of pressure on Thorpe to resign, but he refuses. Instead, he goes to the Sunday Times to publish a rebuttal of Scott's allegations with the title, The Lies of Norman Scott. Okay, then it gets worse. Then Bessel, in California, he's trying to cover his ass and make a quick buck, so he sells out his friend and changes his story to the Daily Mail. Thorpe is terrified that the papers would print his letters, so he beat them to the punch, and he gave the Sunday Times two letters to print, which was kind of ballsy. He's almost like, I know that you guys have some of my letters, so instead of waiting for you to come out with the letters, I'm going to show my hand first. But that didn't help, and unfortunately, readers are now convinced that Scott and Thorpe w did indeed have a relationship at one time. So... On May 10th, 1976, he resigned as liberal leader, surrounded by criticism, but denying Scott's allegations the whole time. After Thorpe's resignation, the investigative reporting continues. 
The reporting led again to Bessel, who spilled the beans on the whole story, including the plot to murder Scott and Thorpe's role in it. But before they could publish the story, this is great. The pilot gets out of prison in October 1977, and he sells his story to the London Evening News. He said he was paid £10,000 to kill Scott, and he provides proof of it with pictures of payments. And after a long investigation, Thorpe, Holmes, the carpet guy, the fruit guy, they're all charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Thorpe was additionally charged with incitement to murder on the basis of his 1969 meeting with Bessel and Holmes. After being released on bail, Thorpe declared, quote, I am totally innocent of this charge and will vigorously challenge it. Okay. He's out on bail, but now we start the trial. At the trial, reporting restrictions are lifted and the papers are free to print anything said in court. So Thorpe is pissed because he was hoping for privacy to avoid the newspaper headlines. He knew now his career was over and that Scott would win the battle. Bessel admits in court about the meeting he had with Holmes and Thorpe where Thorpe suggested Holmes should kill Scott. Then the pilot testifies that Holmes said he wanted to kill Scott saying, quote, he would prefer it if Scott vanished from the face of the earth and was never seen again. It was left to me how to do it. They shouldn't have left it to the pilot because obviously he had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> Scott described how he was seduced by Thorpe on many occasions and explained what happened the day his dog was shot. Scott said homosexuality was an incurable disease and that Thorpe had, quote, infected him and he should therefore be responsible for taking care of him for life. By the end, the magistrate sent all four defendants to the criminal, uh, the Central Criminal Court or the Old Bailey, which we covered in a previous podcast because that's where Dennis Nilsson was tried four years earlier. During the trial, Thorpe loses his seat in North Devon to the Conservatives. The prosecution said during the trial, quote, the higher he climbed on the political ladder, the greater was the threat to his ambition from Scott. His anxiety became his, an obsession and his thoughts desperate. So the trial begins on May 8th under Sir Joseph Cantley, a judge with limited experience in high-profile cases. He immediately takes a liking to Thorpe, and his one-sidedness is pretty obvious. Thorpe hires George Carmen to defend him. Carmen undermines Bessel's cred by revealing his financial interest in Thorpe's conviction. Basically, Thorpe's lawyer said, hey, you can't believe anything Bessel is saying because Bessel has sold his soul to um, the newspapers and he gets double the money if Thorpe is um, found guilty. So uh, on June 7th, the fruit machine guy named Deacon testifies that he put the pilot in touch with Holmes, but he thought it was a deal to, to um, it was just a deal to take care of the blackmailer and that he didn't know anything about murder. The fruit salesman is the only one who testifies. The others remain silent and call no witnesses because they believed, based on the testimonies, that the prosecution had failed in proving their case. During his closing speech, on behalf of Thorpe, Carmen raised the possibility that Holmes and the others may have organized the conspiracy without Thorpe's knowledge, which we know is not true at all. On June 18th, while summing up the case, George Judge Cantley described Thorpe as, quote, a national figure with a very distinguished public record. Whereas he thought Bessel was a humbug whose contract with the Sunday Telegraph was deplorable. He said Scott was a fraud, a sponger, a whiner, a parasite. And those are all true. But of course, he could still be telling the truth, he said, which is a question of belief. And the pilot was characterized as a perjurer and a chump, determined to milk the case as hard as he can. So the jury deliberates for two days and acquits all four men on all charges. In a brief public statement, Thorpe says that he considers the verdict as, quote, totally fair, just, and a complete vindication. Of course, he thinks that. The Liberal Party heaves a collective sigh of relief at the verdict and hopes that Thorpe would, quote, after a suitable period of rest and recuperation, meaning you need to go away for a while so people can forget about this story, that he find many avenues where his great talents may be used. Anyway, despite getting off, public opinion of Thorpe was that he had behaved badly and that he had not really explained himself. So he wasn't allowed to go back into politics. Instead, in 1982, Thorpe was appointed to Amnesty International as director of its British section, but there were protests and he withdrew. Then he starts to show signs of Parkinson's and he withdraws completely from public life by the 1980s. 
But in 1988, following the merger of the Liberals and the Social Democratic Party, the newly formed North Devon Liberal Democrat Association made him their honorary president. When he attended the Liberal Democrat Party conference in 1997, he received a standing ovation. In 1999, Thorpe publishes his political memoir, In My Own Time. And nine years later, in January 2008, Thorpe gave his first press interview in 25 years to The Guardian. Referring to the affair, he said, quote, and this is important, If it happened now, I think the public would be kinder. Back then, they were very troubled by it. It offended their set of values. Then Thorpe dies on December 4th, 2014. At the same time, Scott, then age 74, is reported to have relocated from Devon to Ireland, although another count places him in a village in Dartmoor with 70 hens, three horses, a cat, a parrot, a canary, and five dogs. And so ends the twisted story of power, politics, homophobia, blackmail, and greed surrounding the Jeremy Thorpe affair. Um, so I hope all of that made sense to you. I mean, I was trying to capsulize the entire thing, but I mean, it stretched over so many years and there were so many players. Um, so if you want to get into it a little bit more, um, there was a three-part television miniseries, miniseries adapted by the book, which was written by Russell T. Davies, um, likewise titled A Very English Scandal, written by Stephen Frears and starring Hugh Grant as Thorpe and Ben Whishaw as Scott. Um, so that might be a fun thing for you to watch. Um, I did get my information, most of it, from from Wikipedia, which is a very, very extensive uh, page. Um, I also got information from radiotimes.com. That was basically all I needed. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you on the next episode of True Gay Crime. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to find the True Gay Crime Facebook page and follow us on Instagram at True Gay Crime. And we'd love to hear from you. Do you have an LGBTQ crime story from your city? You can send your story to truegaycrime at gmail.com, and I'll share it on a future episode of the show. Did you know you can subscribe, rate, and review True Gay Crime on Apple Podcasts? It would mean everything to me if you did, because it helps me create content you like, and it lets Apple know to share it with more people. Thank you for listening. And remember, always look behind you, lock your doors, tell someone where you're going, and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along?